For those of you starting an anesthesia rotation, this video is made to give you a general overview of what goes on behind the curtains, so you have a basic framework with which to start inserting information. Empirically, anesthesia appears to look easy. You take a patient to the operating room, put them to sleep, watch their vital signs, and wake them up. Well, this is pretty much the gist of what anesthesiologists do. It obviously involves much more to make it a subspecialty of its own. Again, this video is just a very basic overview, and there will be others that will go into some of the aspects in further detail. So the day of the anesthesiologist stops, starts roughly 45 minutes to one hour before the first case begins. Even before seeing the first patient, the anesthesiologist has to set up the room. One mnemonic you may hear the residents or the attendings use is Miss Maids. Basically shows you what you need to set up before you go see the patient. So it stands for monitors, so blood pressure EKG monitors, suction, M is for machine, make sure the anesthesia machine works. A is for airway, so the laryngoscope, stylet, oral airway. I is IV materials, for if we're going to place an IV. D is the drugs. And S is any special equipment pertaining to that case. So the next step is to see the patient. The purpose of seeing the patient is to do a quick double check of what was read in the chart in terms of previous medical conditions, meds, allergies, as well as to get a better sense in person of aspects relating to anesthesia. So looking at the airway to determine how difficult the intubation might be, as well as asking about chipped teeth, dentures, crowns to further guide intubation techniques, and figuring out cardiovascular pulmonary status to determine how much vital signs need to be kept in check and whether there will be problems with extubation. Typically, the patient will also need to sign an anesthesia consent form after the visit is finished. The anesthesiologist will then wait around until the paperwork on the surgery side and nursing side is completed and the OR is ready to take the patient back. Only now do you finally get to the anesthesia portion where the patient gets to be put to sleep. Again, this is just a brief overview, but what happens simply put, is first the patient's brought into the room, moved over to the operating table, and the monitors which we set up previously are attached in this order. So pulse ox, blood pressure cuff, and then EKG leads. The patient is then pre-oxygenated for three to five minutes by the anesthesiologist who places a face mask with, with oxygen. And the goal of pre-oxygenation is substitute the nitrogen and the FRC of the patient with oxygen because when they get, are apneic, they will at least have some oxygen reserves. Once the step is done, the next is induction and relaxation. The patient is given a combination of propofol to induce sleep as well as fentanyl for the upcoming surgery-associated pain. Once the patient is apneic or not breathing, the patient is then mask ventilated. If the patient can be ventilated, the patient will receive relaxant. You might hear of rocuronium or succinylcholine used which will paralyze their muscles to keep them from bucking or gagging during intubation. And once the relaxation agent has its full effect, the patient is intubated through the use of a laryngoscope to visualize the vocal cords and insertion of the endotracheal tube through the vocal cords. The endotracheal tube is connected to the machine and a combination of fogging or chest rise or breath sounds show that the tube is in place. An anesthetic gas is then turned up as the main anesthetic during surgery, and the patient's vitals are monitored. Other meds might be given to the patient based on heart rate or blood pressure, as well as increasing the doses of pain meds during the more stimulating portions of the surgery. Now, just as the surgery is wrapping up, the patient is usually allowed to breathe on their own. This basically means turning off the vent and allowing the CO2 to rise so that the patient will take spontaneous breaths. The gas is then dialed down or shut off, and depending on how much relaxation agent was given, or whether the patient does not have any twitches in response to stimulus, or how conservative you are as an anesthesiologist, reversal agents such as neostigmine or atropine may be given. Once the surgery is over and the drapes are taken down, it's time to extubate. So here, the patient's oropharynx is first suctioned to remove any saliva, as well as to provide stimulus to wake the patients up. 
the ET or end tidal CO2 monitor is watched, as well as the end tidal volume number to determine whether the patient is taking in adequate tidal volumes. Finally, the patient is asked whether they can open their eyes or squeeze someone's hand. These are examples of purposeful movements, which in a nutshell means that the patient will be able to breathe on their own once the endotracheal tube is removed. Once the patient meets criteria for extubation, the endotracheal tube is then pulled out quickly and replaced with a face mask. Fogging and end tidal CO2 readings on the monitor are good indicators that the patient can breathe on their own and that the mask can be switched for a simple O2 mask. Following this, the patient is then brought to the PACU, or post-anesthesia care unit, and the cycle begins again. So now for the take-home points. Room setup and focus anesthesia exam occurs before the patient enters the OR. The basic sequence of anesthesia include induction, relaxation, and intubation. And at the end of the case, the anesthetic agents are stopped, the patient is allowed to breathe on their own, and when the patient can indicate their ability to breathe on their own, the patient is extubated. Thank you.